Welcome. Thank you for joining me for this second session on horned oak gall. We had such a, such a big response the first go round uh, that we decided to do another presentation. That way everybody could get uh, get their CEU credit for this. Uh, we're recording this for some YouTube views later, so uh, let's go ahead and get started with this. A little bit about myself. I'm the South Central Technical Manager for Arborjet. I live in the Dallas area. I've been with Arborjet for six years. Uh, prior to that, I worked in the tree care world. I was the plant health care manager at a Dallas area tree care company. I also did some climbing. I was a substitute crew leader, stump grinding, drag brush. Uh, did some you know, diagnosing, sales, tree surveys, you know, a little bit of everything. I became a certified arborist in 2011. And at the end of 2017, I became a board certified master arborist. Uh, I went to school at Texas Tech, where I achieved a bachelor's degree in agronomy and a master's degree in crop science. So my education is really geared towards uh, plant soil science, growing things, pesticides, fertilizers, uh, really everything towards cropping. And so uh, how I got involved in tree care is uh, my, I moved to DFW after college with my now wife um, and realized very quickly they weren't growing cotton in the Dallas Metroplex, so I, I got involved in tree care and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, really enjoy working on, in arboreal culture and what I do now is just a, a perfect fit for me, being able to work with other arborists and landscape professionals and, and helping to improve uh, their tree care and plant health care programs. Okay, so horned oak gall. This is a very interesting gall. Uh, by and large, most gall-forming insects are nuisance. They do not cause enough damage to, to really represent treatment as being necessary. However, this one, uh, especially in certain areas of the country, uh, the infestations are very, very heavy. Uh, St. Louis is where I first noticed this pest. I started covering that area of my uh, geography about three years ago, and it's like the first thing I saw, uh, there was a tree near my hotel that was loaded with this stuff. And I was like, man, that's a really crazy looking gall. Uh, it turns out they've been having issues with this gall in that area for going on 15, maybe even longer years. And it's, it's become a problem to the point where some of these large trees are having to be removed. Not only that, uh, St. Louis is also dealing with emerald ash borer. And so you've got this pest that's taking out all the ash trees, and then you have this other one that's beginning to take out oak trees. And so uh, I thought it was important for us to be doing some research on this pest uh, so that St. Louis is, actually has a tree canopy uh, after all this is over with. It's also really heavy near uh, Louisville, Kentucky. That's another area that's pretty bad. So why this is killing trees is these galls, uh, they inhibit the vascular conductivity, so the movement of water and nutrients through the tree's vascular system. And so you can see that top photo there. If you look in the bottom left corner of it, you can see uh, how thick the stem is. And then after the gall, the stem is much smaller. So that gall is like a, a roadblock to the tree's vascular system. And so over time, with as many galls as get on these trees, it really reduces the vigor of the tree, uh, and it over time causes dieback, limb failure, uh, and just tree decline. Right now, there's no pesticides that are specifically labeled for horned oak gall. Uh, there has been, you know, if you pull up research publications or uh, extension publications, it's going to talk about cultural control options. Uh, when I tell people in St. Louis to prune out the infested branches, and yeah, they say, well, we may as well just cut the tree down then at that point. And I'm going to show you guys some photos here in a little bit of, of why they say that, because it is a really heavy infestation. Uh, another thing is to boost, boost the tree's vigor with fertilizers. Uh, and then on the heavily infested trees, go ahead and take them out. So one of, re one of the reasons uh, this pest is so fascinating uh, besides the unique gall that it makes, is that it has a very complex multi-generational life cycle. Uh, it's one of the life cycles that 
entomologists just get super excited about because it's really bizarre. It takes 33 months from the time that those galls start on the stems uh, for the adult to, to complete their life cycle. So it's a very long, complicated thing. So uh, how it starts is females emerge out of those twig galls. So each of those horns that you see on the gall is like an escape hatch for these females. And when they come out of there, they are parthenogenetic, which means they're already fertilized and capable of laying, laying eggs right away. So what they do is they come out of their escape hatches, they fly up to the buds. So this is happening uh, in early spring uh, before the leaves have come out. So the, flea, the females fly up to the buds and they deposit their eggs. And where the eggs are put are right on the veins of these unformed leaves. And so that middle photo is uh, the leaf gall stage of this insect. And in each one of those little blisters that's formed on the leaf, is about 200 more eggs. From that leaf gall stage, uh, male and female adults will emerge uh, in summer, approximately July time frame. That generation will mate, and then they will initiate, you know, the, the females from that generation will sting the stems, initiating the, the new stem gall. Now uh, the galls will continue to develop over two years uh, with the larva inside of there. So just kind of a, a flow chart of what I'm describing. Um, starting at the kind of top left arrow uh, where that horned oak gall is, the females are emerging out of there in April, stinging the buds, starting the leaf gall. In July, the adults come out of there, they mate, and then initiate another stem gall. That takes two years for that stem gall to mature, and then the cycle just repeats. And so what's so challenging about controlling this pest is because they're inside of that gall, and they're really protected from uh, pesticides when, when they're inside of there, either contact or systemic pesticides, uh, the way that gall tissue works. And so it can be very challenging to take those out. So we started some research on this pest back in 2015. Uh, what we looked at was our triage product is currently labeled for stem gall wasps and I'll show you, uh, we're gonna look at the label here in a moment. Uh, and the research that's been done on stem gall wasps is on the banyan stem gall wasp and the black oak gall wasp. And so back in 2015, we started this research in Starlight, Indiana. As working, we were working with Cliff Sadoff out of Purdue. And so we tested uh, triage at a five milliliter per inch rate, uh, just a straight under, you know, straight formulation. And then we also tried it diluted. And the thought process behind that was uh, if we diluted the materials with water, it may help push the material out uh, past those galls, because like I said, the roadblocks. So we're trying to push it out past that. And then dinotefurin was another active ingredient that was also uh, put into that trial. So this is some of the results from that first trial back in uh, 2015. And I'm just gonna read uh, the excerpt there at the bottom. This is from Don Grossman, he's our entomologist. He says, galls collected in 2017 from the 2016 growth were significantly lighter and smaller on the triage treated trees compared to those collected from the untreated checks. Although not significant, the number of galls per stem, percent of galls with larva, and the number of larva per gall trended higher on the untreated check trees compared to the triage treated trees. Uh, so what he's saying, the galls were smaller in size, less larva inside of them, uh, but the number of galls per stem was not significantly different on, on, the tree dot, on the treated trees. So this, this slide is showing the number of galls per stem. So it was a little bit less, but not uh, statistically significant from that first trial. Uh, however, 
that the work was kind of indicating to us that there was some effect going on. The fact that there were fewer uh, larvae inside of the galls and that the size of the galls was smaller is indicating there was some type of effect going on. Um, so from his write-up that he did, Dr. Grossman says, it appears that the triage treated the triage treatment supplied at moderate rates of 5 milliliters per inch may provide some suppression of stem gall numbers and development. Perhaps an application at a higher rate, 10 milliliters per inch, would provide better control. And so that's what uh, the most recent research is, is being done. So we went back, uh, we treated in Starlight, Indiana back in, 2000, in April of 2018 with a high rate of triage with 10 milliliters per inch. And then we started another trial in uh, St. Louis at Calvary Cemetery, uh, also using the high rate of triage. Uh, and an additional treatment as a piggyback application, uh, we applied our imidacloprid or Imajet formulation uh, to some of the trees in an attempt to reduce the leaf gall uh, aspect of, of this pest. Uh, so triage, just to refresher on this product, 4% uh, imamectin benzoate. The original formulation is a restricted use pesticide. A few years ago, we were able to reformulate the product and we launched it as triage G4. The G is for general use. So it's a general use pesticide, uh, which that just has to do with, uh, in terms of the legal aspects of that or who can buy it and what kind of records you have to keep. Um, and the difference in the formulation just has to do with uh, some of the inert ingredients. The original formulation is a severe eye irritant. Uh, with G4, uh, the eye irritation is not as bad, and so that dropped it down, down into the general use category. This is a broad spectrum insecticide, highly effective on insects with chewing mouth parts. Uh, it's most widely used for emerald ash borer, but it's effective on a wide range of pests. Okay, so here we go. We have a look at the triage G4 label. We're looking right there in that red box. It says gall wasps, including the stand, uh, banyan stem gall wasps. And so you can see on the rates that it's recommended for those pests is medium to high. And so I'm going to use an example of a 20-inch diameter tree. If a 20-inch tree, the, the medium rate, you see we have a range there. And so on our initial trial, we're using 5 milliliters per inch, which on a 20-inch tree would be 100 milliliters. So that's right in the middle of that range. Um, our latest trial that we saw in 2018, we were using the high rate of product. So 10 milliliters per inch on a 20-inch tree as 200 milliliters, which falls right in that range for high rate of product per tree. We we're also testing out uh, our latest formulation of triage, triage R10. Uh, you can see in that top bullet point, the active ingredient percentage is much higher for triage R10. It's a 9.7% imamectin benzoate, so essentially two and a half times the strength of the 4%. Uh, the R in R10 stands for restricted use because it does fall into that severe eye irritant category. Uh, it's labeled for all the same pests. Uh, the real advantage with this product is the smaller amount of volume that's required to treat per tree. Uh, because it is such so much more concentrated, uh, we're able to treat with lower dosages of material, which speeds up efficiency. So a lot of the trees that, we, that we're trying to inject um, for EAB or maybe pine bark beetles can be slow to uptake the materials, especially when you're trying to put in a, a larger volume. And so with this higher concentration, we're able to cut down that volume and speed up our injection times uh, and still deliver the same amount of active ingredient. Another cool thing about triage R10 is it's compatible to be mixed with our fungicide propozole. And so there's some pests, uh, like different species of bark beetles, that will uh, carry a fungus with them. And so by being able to combine triage R10 with propozole, uh, you can 
just by making one application of that mixed solution, you can kill the insect pests as well as prevent the disease from uh, taking over the tree's vascular system. So looking at the triage R10 label, there's gall wasps, medium to high rate. Back to my example of a 20 inch tree, uh, you can see the medium rate on a 20 inch tree is only 40 milliliters per inch. So that's, uh, or 40 milliliters per tree, so that's two milliliters per inch. The high rate, is 80 milliliters for a 20 inch tree. So that's only a four milliliter rate as opposed to the 10 milliliter rate on the 4% product. This is a, a graph showing the efficacy of triage R10 uh, when we were testing it on ash trees. So this is looking at percentage crown thinning of ash trees, which is the, the common way to to view the efficacy of pesticides against emerald ash borer. And so what I have circled there in green is the research done uh, looking back starting in 2015 uh, compared to the, the lines on the right hand side of the untreated checks. So you can see the untreated trees uh, starting in 2018 were really beginning to separate out from any of the treatments that were applied. And then in 2019 they had uh, almost 60% canopy thinning compared to the treatments uh, that were all less than 10% canopy thinning. Okay, so this is our research site in Starlight, Indiana. This is like textbook. This is the perfect place to be doing research. Uh, all the trees are about the same size, I think uh, 15 to 18 inches in diameter. Uh, they're spaced pretty close together, easy to, to access. The trees are right off the road. Uh, and you can you can see even that left-hand photo, the amount of galls in those trees. And looking at the right-hand photo, I mean, these trees were, were pretty heavily infected with the galls. And this is what I was talking about, how the galls are like roadblocks and why it's such a challenge. And so each one of those is slowing down the vascular movement of materials. And the challenge with systemics and why we think that the higher rate of triage may provide better control is because we have to put a lot of material into that tree in order to get enough active to move past those roadblocks and get into the new tip growth. Because the idea behind treatment is to get your active ingredient into the new growth so that when the new galls are initiated that um, it kills those larvae right away as soon as they begin to feed. Because essentially these older, more mature galls that are already on the tree, uh, it's, it's not believed that the pesticide actually gets into that growth, into that gall formation. And so you need it into the, the new tip growth uh, to, to kill the new galls that are going to be formed. This is our research site, or part of it at uh, Calvary Cemetery in St. Louis. This is one of the oldest cemeteries uh, west of the Mississippi and these trees are humongous. That tree in the foreground is like 40, I think it's like 43 inches in diameter. So just an enormous tree. Uh, the ones in the background are even bigger. And the reason we, <laughs> so it's not the greatest site for research in terms of ease of access and uh, you know, being able to, to prune branches out of the trees easily to, to count galls and, and look for new gall growth, uh, it's actually pretty challenging. But the reason we are working on this site is because I actually saw a news story out of St. Louis where the cemetery was having to remove uh, many of these large old pin oaks. And it was just causing all kinds of problems. Uh, not The removal process was very labor intensive because these trees are huge. Uh, but why they're taking them out is because these galls would fall out of the trees. And as they're trying to mow the grass, it's destroying their mowing equipment. Uh, these things are golf ball size or larger. And then also the galls would fall into the streets and collect on the drainage grapes. And then leaves would collect on top of the galls and the water couldn't drain. And so they would have water backing up uh, on the streets throughout the cemetery 
and they've had to replace asphalt and all kinds of just there's like a ripple effect from these galls, just all the different problems they were having. And so I saw it as an opportunity for us to, to do some research and then hopefully uh, help the cemetery uh, protect their trees and, and keep them around because it's, you know, taking out all the pin oaks in the cemetery that are affected is just a massive undertaking. It's a humongous cemetery uh, and very costly to them. So on the right there, you can see just the size of, of what these galls look like. Uh, that's my hand. I mean, their golf ball size are larger. There's a lot of weight to them. And so that picture on the left, you can just see how the, the branches are kind of droopy. You know, rather than being perky and pointing up, the branches have this droop to them because the, the weight of those galls is so heavy. Okay, so this is... Uh, data collected last year, so uh, fall 2019 data examining the 2019 growth. And so we're, what we're looking at here is the, the bars on the right-hand side. So this is all of, uh, all of our trees combined. Uh, we had them broken out into different categories of medium infestation, uh, heavy infestation, um, and kind of in between there. So medium, medium heavy, and heavy. And so what I want to focus on is combining all that data together to where it's treated versus untreated. And so we had uh, six check trees that survived through the first year of uh, not being treated and 21 trees that were treated. And so what Don Grossman was doing is he, was, he collected branch samples and he was looking at the new tip growth to see if there were galls initiated uh, on it. And so that's what that image on the top left is. That's what the beginning stages of that gall look like. It's just kind of this uh, deformity on the stem. And so what, what we found is a 68% reduction in the number of newly formed galls on that growth. And so kind of an indication of this, what we're, what we're trying to do, you can see this photo on the left, is provide clean tip growth. So what is already on that tree, the galls that are already there, there's nothing we can do about that. I think over time they may break off or fall off or squirrels will eat them or whatever, but what's there is there. What we are trying to accomplish is getting clean tip growth on the tree. So management, uh, management strategy for horned oak gall is to prune out as much as practical. And that's, it's not really targeting any specific uh, percentage of infested branches, but just prune the tree. You know, just prune it regular. Uh, that way, whenever you treat it, the pesticide is going to be that much more concentrated in, in the biomass of that tree. You want to inject the trees with triage in spring to early summer using that high rate, the 10 milliliter rate. So you want that pesticide into the new tip growth before the wasps initiate the new stem galls in July. I'm also recommending to promote tree vigor uh, using our micronutrient formulations called Minjet FE. A lot of these trees uh, kind of have a chlorotic look to them because of the galls uh, blocking the movement of, of nutrients. And so doing a piggyback application of the micronutrients, it gives the trees, a, it, it boosts their vigor. Uh, you'll see a green up response out of the trees. And that's helpful for a couple of ways. Um, one, it's helping the tree vigor. And two, it's giving that visual response. So if you're selling this service to a homeowner, they can see that tree is improving. That's going to that's gonna make them feel warm and fuzzy inside. So you want to be able to see that improvement from the treatments. And then you're going to need to inject those that same tree again in two years. And so like we injected trees in 2018, and uh, Don and I have already arranged to go back and treat the same trees in the cemetery uh, towards the end of March. And so it's going to take a minimum of two rounds of treatment 
because those galls take so long to mature, um, you need to come back for a second round of this of this treatment. And finally, uh, with this management strategy, you're not only targeting uh, the gall wasp, but triage is a very, very effective insecticide. Uh, you're going to be helping that tree in a lot of different ways because you're going to prevent very diff various different uh, caterpillars, wood borers, bark beetles, mites, sawflies, leaf miners, all these pests that feed on the tree and and uh, reduce its vitality. You're going to you're going to clean that tree up and, and reduce a lot of insect pressure off of it. Okay, so the treatment of horned oak gall wasp, it's, there's going to be some costs associated with this because we are using such a high rate of triage. So these are approximate figures. Uh, triage G4 at the 10 milliliter per inch rate uh, is, is going to cost the applicator about $4.90 per inch. That's your material cost on triage. If you choose to piggyback that with the micronutrients, which I think if you've already gone through the process of, of drilling the tree, uh, you may as well piggyback that, put, put something that's going to help the tree's vigor in there. Uh, it would be about $0.58 cents per inch associated with the micronutrients. Uh, the arbor plug, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, that adds about $0.25 cents per inch. So uh, back to my example of a 20-inch diameter pin oak, our total cost with this program is about $5.75 per inch. So the applicator cost to treat a 20-inch tree uh, that you're incurring, incurring is $115 on your chemical cost. So what I would recommend is to bid this treatment out uh, around $15 to $20 per inch. And that should be enough uh, built in there to recoup, not only recoup your chemical costs, but any of your, your labor and drive time included with that. I put that range on there because you may get on a property that has a lot of these oak trees on it. And if that's the case, you could bid it on the lower end of that spectrum. Or if you're just doing one tree in one yard, uh, you may want to be on that higher end of the spectrum because of the, the drive time and, and labor associated with that. Okay, moving on to oak itch mite. This is a uh, interesting little critter that I luckily have not had the experience of, of being bit by just yet. Uh, apparently, it's similar to a chigger bite, but much worse. Uh, the welts on people can be quite large. Um, and they're not biting you on purpose. This is a parasitic mite. Uh, it parasitizes a midge gall in oak trees. And they're windblown. So basically what happens is these, these little mites will just fall out of the trees. And you know they're active through the summertime. So when people are out in their yards or enjoying their deck or, or whatever, they're underneath some trees. And these mites just get on you. They'll bite you. Uh, just incidentally, they fall on you and they just... Uh, their only response is to bite. And so this is what happens. If you do get bit by these guys, uh, the treatment is cortisone cream, just like you would most any other insect bite. And so some years are worse than others uh, with the oak leaf itch mite. And you can see that uh, screenshot from the news article. It says, dermatologist sees five patients a day with bites. So you can imagine... Um, during high pressure years, just the, the discomfort it's causing for, for people. So these mites are really small, microscopic. There's uh, 0.2 millimeters, so less than half a millimeter in size. And they re reproduce very rapidly, uh, one to two weeks for a female to reproduce. And each female is producing 215 off 250 offspring. Um, these are found across the globe, uh, and they are parasites to various different hosts. In the United States, uh, the most common host species is a midge gall. What I was finding on research publications is that they are favored by cool, wet conditions. When I was in St. Louis uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about this pest, they said they had a cool, wet year in 2019. And they really didn't get any calls about this problem. So who knows uh, 
Insects are, and parasites can be cyclical. Some years are worse than others. So the midge galls that they are associated with in the United States, uh, there's two different ones. One is the marginal oak gall, which is the top photo. So you can see how that gall is around the, uh, the leaf margins or the edge of the leaf, and it causes this curling of the leaf. And so where that is curled over or appears to be curled over, it's actually a, a gall that's formed under there, and it's caused by a midge, which is a type of fly. The other species of midge gall is called the vein pocket gall. And this is what I had experience with in the Dallas area. So these midge flies, they actually live underground. And then as soon as the trees leaf out in early spring, they fly up out of the ground and they lay their eggs and start this gall formation. And they tend to affect the same trees over and over again. Uh, when I was uh, doing plant health care services, we had several people that had this uh, vein pocket gall. And we were trying all sorts of stuff to try to uh, reduce the, the effects of the, of the critter. Generally speaking, it's a nuisance pest. does not require treatment. But I have worked on some trees that were, were severely affected by the vein pocket gall. And their health was, they were declining in health because the infestation was so bad, it was causing the, the leaves to curl up, which reduces the photosynthesis that the leaf can do. And year after year after year of this infestation, uh, the trees were prematurely defoliating, and they were just uh, starting to decline. And so this is what the heavy infestation can look like. And so you can see how that's going to affect the, the trees functioning uh, year after year. So just kind of a uh, some anecdotal experience. Uh, the trees that I'm referring to is actually a family friend. And he was telling me that he'd go and break up these oak leaves in the fall and just get covered with these bites. And at the time, I was unfamiliar with the oak itch mite. Um, but as I started covering Kansas and Missouri, that's when I learned what it was. And so I, it became my mission to get rid of these galls that were all over his leaves. And so I tried treating with uh, various different insecticides uh, that we have, uh, our Imaget, our triage. You know, I was trying to treat at different times of the year. I treated in the fall. I treated in the spring. Neither one of those pesticides touched this gall. And so finally I said, you know what, the last thing I know what to do is to treat with AceJet, which is acephate. It is labeled for gall midges. But the timing is super specific. Uh, and so I went back, I want to say it was in, uh, I treated his trees in the spring of 2018 with AceJet uh, when they were flowering, so uh, before the leaves had, had come out. And so with AceJet, how this works, I'm going to go back to my 20-inch tree example because it makes the math really easy. Uh, HJET is a dry product, so you'll take, there's a little packet inside of that box. Uh, it contains 15 grams of HJET. You'll put that into your chemical supply bottle. Add 100 milliliters of water, and that is enough material to treat a 20 inch tree. Uh, it is important to use up what you mix up. Uh, this is just an excerpt out of our label. There is another uh, rate section in there as well that will allow for uh, higher use rates of the material, but just for simplicity and, and ease, um, 15 grams of ace jet mixed with 100 milliliters of water is enough to treat a 20-inch tree. That's the, the easiest way to use this material. But this is a broad spectrum. If you look at, at kind of the, the left column there, different caterpillars that are on it, leaf miners, midges, sawflies, adelgids, aphids, white flies, lace bugs, you name it. Uh, spider mites is the bottom one on there. Uh, Ace jet or acephate is an organophosphate. It is a broad spectrum insecticide. It's a very old insecticide, uh, but you can see it's got a caution label, so it's relatively safe to the applicator. It is a fast knockdown, short residual material. 
And so essentially what I tell people is, like, if you name me a bug, I can almost bet you it's on the HJET label. Not only that, is it, it's an inexpensive product to use. So the management strategy for the oak itch mite, or really what you're trying to do is control the vein galls, is to inject the trees early in the spring, prior to the leaf coming out. So that photo there, that's even a little bit too late. Uh, so you want to get it either during bud swell or flowering. Your cost on Ace Jet is going to be approximately 80 cents per inch. So it's uh, a lot it's a very uh, low cost application. Like I said, I'd also recommend uh, doing a piggyback either with MinJet FE or PhosphoJet, both of which are going to have uh, benefits to the vigor of the tree. Um, oaks or pin oaks tend to be chlorotic, uh, especially through the Midwest because of the alkaline soils. So this is a good opportunity if you're already going through the trouble of uh, drilling and injecting the tree to come back with the micronutrients. Uh, or phosphojet, if you're unfamiliar with that, it's a potassium phosphite, which is technically a fungicide, but it's it's labeled for general tree decline. And so it does a lot of things uh, to boost the tree's natural defense system, and it almost gives the trees a fertilizer-type response. That's a really nice product to, to piggyback with. All right. So that's in an ideal world. You can treat early in the spring. However... If oak itch mites are a problem in 2020, you are not going to be called out before they are a problem. You're going to be called out after people are tired of getting bit by these things. So you're going to get called out during the summer months. If that's the case, my recommendation would be to go ahead and treat the trees with ace jet. But you'd need to explain on that visit that, some, uh, that spring is the appropriate time to treat with this material. And so my line of thought behind that is because HJET is uh, one of the most water-soluble chemistries there is, that you can likely get that material through the gall uh, onto those midge larvae that are feeding underneath the gall. I imagine you're going to get some control. The damage is already done. The leaves are going to look curled up and, and nasty like I was showing. However, I do think you can get some control of the larvae and it gets that homeowner involved in the treatment of those trees. It kind of gets some skin in the game, gets them committed. Because what's going to happen is if you say, oh, we're too late already, um, we're going to have to treat them in the spring, there's nothing you can do right now. They're probably going to call somebody else, some pest control some company, or somebody who just does what, they, what the homeowner wants, and they're going to spray the tree with something, and it's not going to do anything at all. So go ahead and treat with Ace Jet, and then pre-book the spring application for, for the next year. Okay, so that's the information I have about uh, horned oak gall and oak itch mite. We're going to go ahead and talk about some of the applications, uh, the procedures for, for Arbor Jet treatments. So everything we do is based off the diameter of the tree or DBH, diameter at breast height. So this is a measurement that's taken at four and a half feet above the soil level. And the easiest way to get this measurement is with the diameter tape. Uh, we sell some. Forestry Supply sells them. Uh, you, you can find them online. Uh, our distributors should have ours uh, available. Get a diameter tape. It does math for you, which is really good. So uh, the diameter, if, if you're just using a regular tape measure, is the circumference divided by pi, or 3.14. The diameter tape does this for you. The number of injection sites when you're injecting a tree, the guideline that we recommend is the DBH divided by 2. So on my 20-inch tree example, that would give me 10 injection sites. If you're using our QuickJet Air or our QuickJet tool, uh, the number of injection sites is always the DBH divided by 2. If you're using our tree IV or our F-series equipment, you have a bit more flexibility with that uh, based on the limitations of the equipment. So the tree IV has four valves on each harness. Uh, the F-series has up to six, and you can adjust it to, to five or four. So if I was using our 
tree ivy that only has four valves on it, I tend to inject the tree or number of injection sites is a multiple of four. So on my 20 inch tree, I would probably just use eight injection sites. I'd still apply the same amount of material, just through fewer sites. And then with, uh, with the F series, I could very easily just use uh, 10 injection sites because of how, how we can manipulate the harness on that piece of equipment. Um, you don't want to exceed DBH divided by three because what happens, you start to get your spacing too far apart and then that reduces uh, the coverage in the canopy. So the tighter the spacing on your injection sites, the better distribution and coverage you'll get throughout the canopy. So the steps when using ArborJet is to drill, plug, and inject. Where to drill? You want to take advantage of the root flares on the tree. Think of the root flares like the artery moving water up to the stem. And so that's like the, the, main, the main vein of that tree. And so that's what you want to tap into. That's where the good con conductivity is happening. Uh, that picture on the right, you can see there's an X on there. Looks like there's a, a girdling root maybe on that tree. That is not a good spot to put an injection site. That's not uncommon when I'm doing a demonstration or, or treating trees. I'll skip over some big flat spots on trees and it, it'll spread my spacing out, but that's not a good spot to put an injection site. There's not much vascular movement there anyways, so you're better off to, to tap into the root flares to where your material can actually move up the vascular system. You want to stay as low as practical uh, within 24 inches of the soil level. Utilize those root flares. What I tell folks, inject on the hills, avoid the valleys. You're going to drill at a perpendicular angle to the tree bark. So that means uh, a 90 degree angle to your surface, straight in. You're not going to be drilling at a, down, a 45 degree downward angle. It's going to be straight in, perpendicular to the tree surface. And typically your, typically your drill depth is an inch to an inch and a half. Uh, it depends on the thickness of the bark though, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, the other point of emphasis I want to make is using sharp drill bits. Uh, we recently redesigned our bits to be a higher helix, meaning they have more twists to them. And so what that means is it cuts the wood faster and it pulls the chips out better. If you think of the tree's vascular system, it's like a, a bundle of straws going up the tree. And so if you had a handful of coffee straws and you were to cut those straws with scissors, you know, if your scissors are really sharp, you'd be able to continue to use those straws. But if you try to cut those straws with dull scissors, it's going to pinch and you're going to end up trying to rip and basically mangle those straws up to where it reduce the flow when you try to use them. That's exactly what happens if with a dull drill bit when you're drilling into the tree's vascular system. Uh, it doesn't make a clean cut. It kind of mangles and rips and twists those vascular vessels, and it, it'll close them over. And so with the sharp drill bit, it's like a surgeon's tool. It's, it's going to be very a, a, quick a quick drill process. It's going to make a nice clean cut. Uh, I don't know how long a drill bit will last. I think a lot of it depends on where you store the drill bit. So if it's rolling around in a toolbox or on the floorboard, it's probably going to get dull. But if you keep it uh, wrapped up in a rag or uh, stored somewhere where it doesn't roll around, it'll probably stay sharper longer. Um, <clears throat> so use the use a sharp drill bit. If you're having to muscle your drill and really put a lot of pressure behind it, uh, you probably need a new drill bit. A brand new one that's sharp, it'll basically pull that, It'll basically pull your arm into the tree as it cuts through the wood. I want to take a moment to talk about the arbor plugs and why they're so important to our application procedure and why we invented this technology. Uh, when ArborJet was first getting started in the early 2000s, um, there were no arbor plugs. Uh, the tree injection systems that were out there uh, we're all plugless. You know, people have been doing macro infusion uh, for a very long time. There's no plugs. And so basically what we found is that the industry uh, was demanding this. 
whenever we were started, that's the market research that was done. They wanted an interface between the injection site and the injection equipment because what was happening with the plugless injection systems was there was a lot of leaking of materials out of the tree and there was a lot of delayed wound closure because there was nothing sealing off that drill site. And so uh, we ran through several different prototypes of the plug. The first ones were made out of brass. Then we moved to aluminum ones. Then we uh, went to plastic. And we've actually recently made a, another change to, to the design uh, of, of how we put the rubber septum inside the middle of that plug. And so what the plug consists of is a piece of plastic that has barbs on the edge. And so those barbs will actually grip into the sapwood of the tree, which allows us to put pressure on the liquid and there won't be any leaking around that injection site uh, when this is done properly. Internally, there's that rubber septum that the needle goes through. So after your dose has been, a, has been applied, you take the needle out, that rubber seals back up, and it keeps everything inside the tree. It, it greatly reduces any type of splashback or chemical leakage out of the injection site. Additionally, the flat surface of the plug speeds the wound closure the compartmentalization of that application site. Just like a proper pruning cut, you see the callus wood forming over that. It's the same process with the arbor plug. Uh, and also, because you're putting that plug in right after you've drilled into the tree, it reduces the incidence of decay or decay organisms from entering into the tree's uh, vascular system. We have two sizes of arbor plugs. Uh, the large uses a 3 8 inch drill bit and the smaller uses a 930 seconds drill. Setting the plugs is critical and this is where uh, I've been doing a lot of refreshing with people. Uh, the most common mistake I see is that the plugs are set too shallow. Uh, they just set, they, a lot of people will set them just flush to the bark when you actually want to get them recessed below the bark. And so in that image on the right you can see uh, the bark is the brown wood. There's a distinct line where it changes from brown to white. The white tissue is the xylem. That's the active uh, water conducting tissue that we're trying to access to inject the tree. And the line where that changes, that's the cambium. The cambium is the area of active growth. And so the idea behind the plug is for the cambium to be able to form wound wood or callus tissue over the top of the plug. And so we need to get the edge of the plug set below that line and that way when that new wood starts to form it can seal right over the top of it. And so you want to see a little bit of a white halo around that plug. So your depth of setting these plugs depends on the thickness of the bark. So when you target the root flares of the tree the bark tends to be thinner and what I've found is about a quarter inch thick on a a lot of different species and the uh, the head on our plug setter is also about a quarter inch long and so I teach people to as you're hammering those plugs in look at the head on that plug setter and when you see the beveled edge get below the bark you're generally at an okay depth uh, not always though sometimes a tree can have thicker bark in which case you can see you can see the dark tissue and the white wood so just make sure you get that plug set to the proper depth um, those trees I mentioned that I treated for the oak um, midge gull, I treated them early in the spring uh, during flowering. When I came back in the summer to check on them, this is what the wound sites looked like. They had already compartmentalized uh, completely over the plugs. So when you treat early in the year when the tree is putting on new wood and growing, it's going to seal up those wound sites very quickly. If you were to treat in the fall of the year when the tree is not growing, it's very good to have that plug in there uh, to prevent any decay organisms from entering because the tree is not going to compartmentalize until the next spring. This is a really great image that was sent to us a few years ago uh, showing in cross-section the, uh, the process of compartmentalization over the plugs. So if you look uh, on the right-hand side of the plug, you can see that callus wood that's formed over uh, during the first season and it grew right over the top of the plug and then uh, another year of growth was also layered on the top of that. Behind the plug into the drill site 
uh, you can see some staining. That's because this tree was treated with triage, which is blue in color, so that's where that staining is coming from. But the actual drill site, uh, there's no decay. It's not punky. Uh, it's just sound wood. And that's because the plug seals it off and protects against those decay organisms. This is just a quick video showing the application process. Okay, so as I mentioned, setting the plugs below the bark is important. Uh, applicator error does occur. And so, like I said, the most common mistake that I see is setting the plugs flush to the bark surface. You can see that in the image there. It's not set deep enough. What happens if this occurs is you're actually going to force the material in between the bark and the sapwood. You're going to force it up into that cambium layer. And uh, what happens then is it actually can split the bark off of the tree and cause some really nasty wounding uh, to the tree. Uh, this occurred in, uh, in a city that was treating for emerald ash borer. They had hired a contractor and there's a lot of applicator error uh, with this <clears throat> with this particular incident. And so you can see several of the plugs uh, right off the bat not set deep enough. And then uh, on the right-hand side of the tree, you can see that hole. And that's basically what happened. That chemistry went in between uh, the bark and the sapwood, and it caused a lot of damage to the trees. And so we were able to, to go there, work with the applicator, uh, train them up on how to do it properly, and reassure the city uh, that there wouldn't be any other problems moving forward. But because of incidences like this, uh, there's been a, a kind of a movement out there to, you know, the plugs are bad. You don't need plugs in ejecting trees because it's causing this damage. And so it's kind of brought up the issue or the, the question to plug or not to plug. And so ArborJet, we've always had a non-plug system. It's called the Stinger Tip. And in fact, the, the USDA uses this in the, uh, <clears throat> the ALB project, Asian Longhorn Beetle. Uh, where they're out injecting maple trees in the woods. Uh, however, there are also issues associated with the plugless system, uh, which is why the plugs were invented in the first place. And so this is a, a tree that was injected with the plugless system, and you can see some chemical leakage. Like I said, the reason, one of the big reasons the plugs were invented was to reduce leakage of chemical. And then from that same injection site, on the left-hand side, you can see the split in the wood. Because you don't have that plug set in there, you know, when I set that plug to the proper depth, I know there's not going to be any pressure on, that, on the cambium. When you're using a plugless tip, you're not really sure where that pressure is going. Uh, for the most part, it's going to go into the xylem, but you're not really sure. And so what happens is it can cause... Uh, some splitting, as you can see on the right photo. The other things that the plugs uh, 
do a great job of is sealing the material inside the tree. And so after the application with a plugless system, you need to leave those tips inside of the tree for, I don't know, a few minutes after all the material has gone out of the tubing. Uh, and what happens is that material has gone in under pressure. There's nothing sealing it inside the tree. And so when you pull those tips out, there can be uh, leakage or, or blowback of the material. And so you can see um, on the left-hand side, that's uh, insecticide coming out of there. It's kind of a foamy because it was applied under air pressure. So there's some foam associated with it. And on the right-hand side, you can see the blue staining uh, that's associated with um, the MMX and benzoate products. There's other different plugless systems out there that uh, are pressurized capsules. And like I said, when you don't have that plug ensuring where the pressure is going, uh, it caused a really nasty wound on this ash tree. So the plugs, plugs were invented for a reason and when they're used appropriately, they're very helpful in, the, in protecting the tree and also sealing all your materials inside the tree. So I saw several of the names of, of the people that were on today. Uh, I know you in my territory. If you live or work in the state that I represent uh, in the south central U.S., um, reach out to me. I'd love to get to know you and help you in any way that I can. Uh, and if you don't know your rep, if you're somewhere else in the United States, uh, our contact info is, is on our website. Uh, reach out to your ArborJet rep. We'd be happy to meet with you and help you in any way that we can. Um, here's my contact information. If you have any questions about the, the material in this presentation, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'd be happy to, to walk you through anything.